It's great to see a lot of familiar faces in the audience today. Thanks for coming out. Uh, I love talking about insects, and it's great to have a, a group of people interested. With, hopefully, you have a lot of good questions for me as well. Um, we've got a lot of topics to cover, a lot of slides. Hopefully, um, I'm not going to bore you with too many graphs, but uh, climate change does require a fair number of graphs to convey. Um, the basic outline of tonight's talk, I'm going to talk about insects in general, how they're this important glue that holds ecosystems together. Um, globally, uh, there have been a number of studies showing insect declines uh, around the world. We're going to touch on a few of those. Um, there's even been some headlines lately talking about insect apocalypse. So we're going to talk about that. Um, and then we're going to focus on insects in Alaska and climate change and what we've learned so far. So globally, if anyone asked, I'm sure you'd be able to answer properly, insects dominate in terms of species richness when it comes to animals. Um, we have about 1.9 million animals with names, uh, species uh, with names so far. Uh, there's a lot that are undescribed. In fact, probably anywhere from five to eight million more are undescribed, have yet to be named, have yet to be discovered. Um, I recently was going through some of my work and I, I realized one of the species I named uh, back in 2006 had been collected in 1898 and hadn't been described until 2006. Um, and it's only known from one place, so hopefully it's still there. Um, if all of the unknown species are included, then arthropods, which are primarily insects, would rise up from 80% of this pie up to about 96% of the pie. So animals, in general, are arthropods. So these have an exoskeleton, six legs. Um, arthropods have a variety of legs. The insects have six. Um, crustaceans have more. Centipedes, millipedes have more, etc. And of course, you all know spiders have eight. So um, Ed Wilson, uh, ant specialist from Harvard who's now retired, but um, in 1987, this is one of the um, points he would make that in a rainforest, if you were to measure the weight of all the animals, 93% uh, of it would be invertebrate, primarily ants and termites. Um, in Alaska, we have our own such measurement. Um, this little creature, which a lot of people are probably unfamiliar with, but this is a uh, springtail. It's got this lovely little tail, allows it to spring. They're ubiquitous. They live in the leaf litter and under raw, rotten logs and um, in moss, et cetera. And uh, one of the researchers here at UAF, uh, Stephen McLean, back in the 70s estimated that in one square mile of arboreal forest, there's the equivalent weight of 43 moose of these springtails and mites <laughs> under your feet. It's a lot of biomass. That's less intuitive. You know, we would think that, um, you know, there's a lot of species, but the biomass is more surprising. Uh, reproductive capacity is enormous. So it's, it's easy to do this math. One fly, for example, this lovely flesh fly I photographed in Indonesia, if all of her progeny survived and bred, and the eggs laid on April 15th, several hundreds per batch, 20 batches, 10-day life cycle. By September, there would be 5.6 trillion offspring from that one fly. That's a lot of great grandkids. Um, this would cover Germany to a depth of 47 feet. Thank you, Germany. <laughs> For my German friend. <laughs> now, why are we not buried in insects? Um, the reproductive output certainly is capable of burying us. The reason is well over 90% of all the potential offspring are never born because, or they're eaten uh, at some earlier stage before they give birth themselves. Um, spiders, which people don't generally love, um, do a huge amount of this. In Alaska alone, we estimate they kill and eat over 300 million pounds of insects every year. That's more than all the moose in Alaska, just being killed by spiders. One pair of chickadees requires between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars to raise their offspring. Um, so there's insects, are, there's just incredible biomass 
incredible diversity, of course, but incredible biomass that keeps our birds, our fish, our flowers pollinated, et cetera. We have um, just this, this glue, this kind of, there's almost invisible um, until a lot of mosquitoes try to drink your blood. Um, a lot of people are unaware of, of the incredible biomass. We have, of course, when we think of animals, we think of these large, pretty easy to see creatures. I was very excited when I saw my first grizzlies, but I was even more excited when I came to Alaska and I saw all of these guys uh, in my backyard. Didn't have to go to a national park to see creatures that I'd never seen before. Coming to Alaska was like coming to another planet or continent, really. I mean, we, it is talked about sometimes as a subcontinent. Um, and there's some really interesting creatures here. We've got this Compton tortoiseshell butterfly. This was first seen in Alaska in 2002, um, at least first established in Alaska in 2002, not first seen, I correct myself. But it, it was seen in the Fairbanks area in 2002 and, is, and maintained its population here. It's growing steadily and spreading. I, I saw one in Galena a few years back. Um, and it is one of our few butterflies that overwinters as an adult. And most of our butterflies spend the winter as a, as a larva or a chrysalis, but this one and a few others will spend the whole winter as an adult butterfly in a hidden place and emerge early in the spring. So a few nice pictures of insects. Uh, this is one I was very excited to see. You may have heard about the caribou botfly. Uh, this um, is uh, not a pollinator. It may look like a bumblebee, um, but in fact, it does something very different. Um, for one thing, it doesn't have a mouth. So as an adult, it doesn't feed at all. Um, what it does is it uh, looks for mates and then looks for caribou. Uh, and once it finds caribou, it lays eggs on the caribou. And the eggs go into the caribou under the skin and feed in the caribou, or there's an, a warble that goes up the nose. So there's two species of flies that um, feed on our caribou, and this is one of them. And this, this one is a male. I saw photographed this in Denali National Park in the tundra where a grizzly had ripped up the tundra and there's just barren dirt. And apparently the flies use these ripped up spots as mating places, like a singles bar. Uh, because, you know, the tundra is so homogenous green, having this bare patch of ground is, a, is an easy place for the flies to find each other. So there's this interesting, you know, grizzly caribou fly connection. Um, our birch shield bug, um, also called a parent bug, it um, guards its young and they feed on birch catkins, one of our prettier of the true bugs. The yellow jackets, which we're going to talk more about later, um, these guys are uh, pretty aggressive and dangerous. Um, this is an overwintering queen I uh, photographed in 2007 after the, the massive outbreak year in 2006 when I first arrived. I thought I had brought my family to a very dangerous place. Um, but it turned out it was a very unusual year, 2006. Um, the number of yellow jacket nests had increased about tenfold above normal. Um, this is a ladybug, but does anybody know what's coming out of uh, its legs there? Ooze. <laughs> yes, that's a great answer. Um, it's very distasteful. It's actually, it's, it's blood. It bleeds reflexively as a defense, and it tastes horrible. So um, if you were to try to eat it, you would be disgusted and decide you didn't like to eat lady beetles anymore, which is exactly what it wants you to think. Um, that's, um, yeah, it's, and you can see there's six little droplets, one coming out of each um, leg joint. A friend of mine in Canada wrote a field guide to lady beetles of Alberta and he tasted all of them, and <laughs> he could tell you which ones were the worst. Um, so we have some beautiful beetles. This is a click beetle, the resplendent click beetle. This is the rainbow beetle, um, a Beringian species that uh, is wingless and walked across the land bridge. It's widely distributed in Asia and occurs in interior Alaska but does not occur south of the Alaska range or north. It doesn't occur up in the Brooks range either. Um, and it's a gardener's friend. It feeds on caterpillars, etc. cetera. Um, good predator to have around. Another adult overwintering. This is, believe it or not, a vegetarian carrion beetle. So it, 
belongs to a family of beetles that are known for feeding on carcasses and dead uh, vertebrates, but this genus um, has given up that lifestyle and feeds on um, plants in the family Chinopodaceae, uh, which includes spinach. In Europe, there's a pest in that group. Okay, so now we're going to get into some graphs. Um, Climate change, uh, when I talk about climate change, and to begin with, I'll give the caveat, I'm certainly not a climate change expert, but what I've, I've learned, um, basically the basics to understand as much as I can about our changing ecosystems. And the, the preface of this um, whole talk would be, or rather, rather a good summary would be, um, that we're in a very dynamic time period. Um, we don't know what the new normal is gonna be. Um, uh, things are changing rapidly. We've got, um, and you'll, you'll see a number of examples of them as, as we go through this talk. But sometimes I hear people say, uh, we're still coming out of the last ice age. That's patently false. Uh, we came out of the last ice age about 5,000 years ago when temperatures started to cool off again. This is the high point of temperatures between 10,000 and about 5,000 years of our, in, our interglacial. And temperature, earth temperatures were cooling down um, and now we have this incredibly rapid rise uh, in temperatures. Um, this is the same graph here. That blue curve is what we're just looking at, but this extends us back to 20,000 years. And people sometimes say, well, oh, we're trying to keep global averages below two degrees above, above historical levels, um, but you know, temperature goes up sometimes 20 degrees in a single day. Why worry about two degrees of warming? That's a classic uh, confusion of climate and weather. Um, since the dawn of agriculture, for all of human civilization, the average Earth temperature has gone up and down about 0.6 Celsius, um, up or down among that average. So that's the boundary, that's the sweet spot that we've been living in. Um, and if we go two degrees, we're gonna be up here. We're gonna be at a global average that no human has ever lived in. Um, and if we go beyond two degrees, who knows what's gonna happen. Um, but here we are, this is that last ice age coming out of that, we peaked. We may have been heading into another ice age. Maybe the global warming is going to stop that new ice age, but um, the ice age would of course taken many thousands of years to arrive, whereas global warming is happening in a matter of decades. Um, <clears throat> so when it comes to insects, this is a paper that really caught my attention because it, um, it helps understand uh, winners and losers. Because there's gonna be some species that are gonna do better under a warming world and some that are gonna do worse. And this graph kind of explains it based on latitude. So if you're near the equator, your change in fitness is going to be negative based on this study. Meaning the species that are in the tropics are gonna do worse. The species that are closer to the higher latitudes are gonna potentially do better based on this simple um, modeling. And the reason for that is, is a bit counterintuitive. People think, oh, the tropics are so warm, they would be used to this warm temperature. But if you think about it, the tropics aren't just warm, they're really stable. Those, the, there's hardly any seasonality there other than maybe dry and wet seasons. And, and so the species there don't have a lot of tolerance for wide changes of temperature. The species up in the north do. And when it gets warmer, they can take advantage of that heat and they can maybe get two generations in a year instead of only one generation. So species in the north potentially can do better, species near the equator um, more likely to suffer. And unfortunately, I don't have a graph, but you all are probably well aware that the closer you get to the equator, the more species there are, significantly more species. So um, we could be looking at half of the Earth species um, suffering under a warmer uh, world, if not more than that. Here's an example of a study looking at a species that might benefit, the gypsy moth. So this is in, there's Salt Lake City there. Here we have 1980 data showing the green are, uh, shows very low probability of gypsy moth uh, surviving in this habitat, but the red is where it can survive in 1980. Projected for 2100 is this map here, where all of that habitat is uh, suitable for the gypsy moth. So that's an example of a species that may, may benefit from a warmer world. The insect apocalypse is here. 
This was a headline, this is New York Times Magazine of November last year. Um, what does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? It was a really interesting feature article and it um, was focused on a study that had come out that year and the author had uh, talked to a lot of entomologists as well to get uh, good, good opinions on this article. But this is an article that came out of Germany. More than 75% decline over 27 years in total flying insect biomass in protected areas. So this is a very unusual data set because it's very rare for us to have 27 years of almost continuous data. Um, and they, they had sampled 63 different locations and these are the kind of uh, places they put their traps. So this is a malaise trap. It's, it's basically, it was invented by a guy named Malaise who uh, came back one day to his uh, tent while he was camping and found it, you know, he left the tent door open and found it full of insects. You probably have all done that yourself. And it turns out it makes a great trap. You just put a little uh, container up at the top there. Insects fly in. They kind of get confused. They don't know where to go. They go up. They end up in your, your catchment, in the alcohol. Um, and so this is the protected areas. Now, in Germany, um, this, there's a lot of agriculture. All these protected areas were basically islands surrounded by agriculture. So um, that may explain a little bit of this. But you know, as you can see from this quote, um, th these protected areas were meant to preserve ecosystem function. And they're clearly not doing that. This is some of their data. So this is over the 27 years, the colors I thought this was a very pretty graph, the way they colored everything. But the dark blue is from 1990. So this is biomass from 1990. So they were getting up to 20 grams a day of insects in July and August in some of these sites in the 1990s. But by the 2010s, they're getting one gram a day or half a gram a day. Um, Where did all the insects go? Um, and they, the loss was greatest in the midsummer. And this, they weren't identifying these things. They were just taking the jars, jars of insects floating in there, and pouring out the alcohol and weighing them. Um, so they had a weight, which is pretty relatively easy to do, but try doing that consistently for 27 years. That, there's very few data sets like that. Um, so that's, that's uh, Germany. That's a temperate zone study. Here we have a study from uh, Greenland. So there's Greenland, nice Arctic location. Um, they found an 80% decline in muscid abundance. So muscids are your house flies, but in the Arctic, they're one of the most important of the pollinators. So if you go out to the Arctic, if you look at sort of what's the most common flies flying around on these flowers up there, they're gonna be muscids. 87, 80% decline over 18 years. Um, and this is, there's no agriculture at this field station. Um, here are the, the, the graphs. So 1996 to 2014, all of the different sites, uh, three of them were significant. This music site was not significant, but um, wet fen in particular was a very significant loss uh, in uh, muscid biomass. So we have a temperate zone study, we have a Arctic study, and uh, then out comes a tropical study. So this one, this one is not as uh, consistent. The first two I mentioned, they had data from every year. This study was a repeat study where they had data from the 70s and then they went back in the 2000s and they compared the two. But this is in Puerto Rico in a uh, national forest where they found um, 60, basically the, in, the, the sticky traps they were using, the uh, biomass estimates were 60 times lower. So you basically take the biomass from the 1970s, divide that by 60, there's your new number. Here's the graph. So uh, my former, one of my former committee members, Dave Wagner, was quoted as saying, holy crap. <laughs> uh, this is one of the most disturbing articles I've ever read. Uh, so here we have the data from the 1970s, here we have the 2000s. All of these studies have been, um, you know, as scientists tend to do, they look for uh, ways the study may have um, been misleading or maybe they came to the wrong conclusions or overstated their conclusions somehow. Um, and so there are criticisms of all of these works out there, but then there's replies. For example, the authors of this work, they have the chance to reply and address those criticisms. Um, so uh, whether they are uh, an accurate depiction of, of a larger area 
or whether they are just um, a snapshot of a very small um, area that is suffering a great loss is, is unknown. I mean, that's, that's one of the problems we have with these sorts of studies is uh, you know, people talk about cherry picking, the idea that if you only look at the negative examples that, and you ignore the positive examples, there's some places where insects are increasing um, or staying the same. Uh, granted, those are great criticisms. So we have a lot more work to do um, to, to, to answer those questions. But what about the birds? So this, this was a, I was on a committee of a, a graduate student here who's studying um, uh, plovers up in um, the Seward Peninsula. And this was a graph she showed and it just really caught my attention that, um, so this is from Canada. Um, their survey from 1970 through 2010, this pink line here, this is the aerial insectivores. So this is perhaps the longest running insect sampling over the largest area is that performed by, this, uh, by these uh, Canadian aerial insectivore birds. A lot of these are migratory, so they are um, potentially suffering habitat loss in their overwintering um, habitats, um, not in Canada. Um, but there's very real concerns that one of the reasons the aerial insectivores are declining um, more than others is their food is declining. Uh, so we've been talking about biomass and talking about insects as food, but um, I care about insects also as species unto themselves. And um, you know we have sequenced the human genome, but we don't yet know how many species we have on the planet. We have not even hit the halfway point of describing life on this planet. Um, and there are some people saying that we've had five major extinction events in the past, including the last big one that wiped out the dinosaurs. Uh, now we're in the sixth one. Um, and this is uh, reiterated by um, Ed Wilson, who thinks that we could lose half of our species within the next 50 years. Um, and the estimates are as high as 26,000 species disappearing per year. Um, a lot of these are insects, and a lot of these could be insects that, that we've never um, even named. Um, so. It's a, it's a changing situation, um, highly dynamic. And into this, um, I uh, entered the University of Alaska Museum in 2006. Um, I um, established a uh, growing um, research collection. Um, and the collection, well, had been started in the year 2000, um, before I arrived. Um, and it was uh, Jim Cruz, who some of you may know, who um, began the collection, and he went to work for the Forest Service, and then I took over as curator in 2006, and here's some of my students and lab techs. We've been working hard to document the insect fauna of Alaska. Uh, insect and spider, and now, as mentioned, earthworms as well. Um, I never thought I'd be working on earthworms. Um, but. No one else is doing it, so. Um, so we all know that we're the largest state. We have the greatest evidence of climate change in, in the US. And we have this really interesting biogeographic complexity too, the Beringian, um, the land bridge. So here's some, some graphs showing the growth of the collection. Um, this is so the year 2000 when the collection began. We've been adding records to our database, and we're now over 300,000 um, records in the database, representing over 1.6 million specimens. These represent over 3,000 species, and we um, know actually that number's wrong. Uh, we're more like 8,600 species um, known for the state. And we've been DNA barcoding these as well, so that um, makes a DNA barcode library, which allows people to identify unknowns using uh, genetic data, using um, DNA from the mitochondrion. Um, and that's being used to understand um, fish and, and bird diets. You know, they take the, the, the old days, <clears throat> the old days you'd have to take the guts out of, of, of the fish and spread it out under a microscope and try to identify it by eye, which is, imagine, a very unpleasant thing to try to do. Now um, they can use DNA. Um, and uh, we put little, uh, little, 2D barcodes on all the specimens in the collection. So um, we um, very into having a fully organized collection that's completely databased as, as we can get it. Um, the 
most of our specimens were collected after the year 2000. So this is the years, um, here's the year 2000, 84% came from after that year. Our oldest specimen was from Greenland in 1889. Um, it's a butterfly, beautiful sulfur. Um, looks like it was collected yesterday. Um, this is the discovery of arthropod species in Alaska. So this dates back to the 1840s when the Russians first began work. And it wasn't until um, the Harriman expedition that we had a real uptick in, in our species counts. But we didn't even break the 1,000 species mark until the 1940s. Then we started adding species to the state list. And now we're at 8,627. But one thing interesting to note about this graph is it's just going straight up. We haven't hit a plateau. If you're working on something like birds or, or, or plants, after a while, you're going to run out of species, and, and you're just going to keep finding the same ones over and over and over, and your graph is going to flatten out. Um, we are far from a, a flat plateau. Um, so we're in this, this still kind of the early baseline stages of just discovering uh, species for Alaska. I um, have taught bug camp quite often. Um, I teach entomology. I have a lot of students. I have people, the public, bring in specimens. And more often than not, they bring in something that is, is new or interesting to the state. I mean, we've, uh, with, with the kids, we find things that are um, new to the list, um, occasionally even new to science. So it's exciting work. Um, and one of, the, one of the projects we did was to look at bumblebees. So we have a, a very large bumblebee collection. It actually occupies an entire cabinet of our um, insect collection. It's just the bumblebees. And um, there's been a, a lot of interest in bumblebees uh, because pollinators are critically important to um, ecosystems and have received a lot of attention from funding agencies and the public. Um, so our bumblebee data were used as part of this large study that um, looked at data from Europe and North America for over a 110-year time span. That's one of the things you can do with museum data is you can go back in time. And uh, what the conclusions were, the species were disappearing along the southern part of their range. Bumblebees were moving north but um, they were not moving north in the northern part of their range. So basically their ranges were getting compressed. Um, and, and this was happening both in North America and in Europe. Um, and so that's, we don't know why. I mean, it's, it's a lot easier to document patterns than to explain why they're happening. Um, we assume it's climate change. Um, we certainly, but we don't know why they're not tracking north in the northern part of their range. Um, so one of the things we're keeping an eye out for is uh, non-native non species. People often say they love living in Alaska because there's no ticks in Alaska, but there's always been ticks in Alaska. Um, and we've had seven native species of ticks. Um, mostly they're on, uh, almost always on wildlife. There is one species of native tick that does occasionally get on cats. Um, uh, Exodes uh, augustus. Um, but uh, the Alaskan Department of Fish and Game has been running a tick monitoring program, and they've been trying to get people to send in any ticks they find, um, and they're very interested, particularly because of the uh, winter moose tick, which would be devastating to moose. They can, they can drain blood from a moose to a point where uh, the young can't survive the winter. Um, so um, we're hoping that doesn't get into the state, but we now have three species that are non-native that do get on people and pets. Uh, we have the American dog tick, we have the brown dog tick, and the lone star tick has all been reported from people or dogs with no travel history. Um, that's the concern. You know, if you, if you bring your dog back from Oregon and it's got a tick, less surprising than if your dog has never left the state and it has a tick. So that's, that's starting to happen and we're worried about this. Um, but, you know, so if you travel with your dogs or you know anybody bringing pets in, you know, uh, use some tick protection to help prevent ticks from uh, getting into the state. Now, we don't know. Are they establishing uh, now because it's warmer in Alaska and they wouldn't have been able to establish in the 1960s or earlier or something? That's an open question. No one's done the, the actual research that would be needed to, to prove that, um, but it's definitely possible. 
We also, we thankfully do not have any insect vector diseases to people in Alaska. Um, the mosquito viruses that are commonly transmitted um, to horses and birds, et cetera, in the lower 48 that occasionally get into people like Eastern equine encephalitis and West Nile virus, et cetera. We don't have these in Alaska. This mosquito, uh, Culex tarsalis, um, is one of the transmitters of um, equine encephalitis and West Nile virus. And it was just recently, uh, last year, uh, found in Kluwani. Um, so um, this species has is, is got potential to get into our state. So we're hoping, fingers crossed, it doesn't. And at least the, the ones that do occur in Canada don't have these diseases. So even though the species is capable of transmitting it, um, the virus is not in the mosquitoes. So, um, so here's the earthworm bit. Um, I uh, had a uh, high school student um, who came to me, uh, Megan Boysen, who's going to be an uh, undergraduate here at UAF, and she said she wanted to do a science project on earthworms. And I, I was like, well, all right. Even, you know, I'm, I'm rather partial towards arthropods, but earthworms are interesting. And there, there is a, a colleague of mine down on the Kenai, Matt Bowser, who's been working on earthworms for a while. And so I talked with him, and we got some protocols figured out. And she did some surveys, and she found some earthworms. The way you do it is you clear the leaf litter, you shake up a bunch of water and, and dry mustard powder, and you pour it on the ground, and the mustard is an irritant to the earthworms, and they come out. Um, and she found, uh, two of her six sites, she found earthworms, and I've had people send in earthworms, uh, bring them into the museum, and so we had a small collection of earthworms as well. And between her work and what people sent in, we had five species documented for Fairbanks. Um, one of them, is the nightcrawler, a uh, European species that is uh, uh, kind of a nasty invasive for forests. Um, the reason for that is um, when nightcrawlers establish and earthworms that behave similarly to them, they feed so heavily on the leaf litter that after they've lived in an area for a while, they basically eat up all the leaf litter. And they move very slowly, five meters a year, very small, slower than glaciers, actually, the earthworms move. The way that they get around is with people, uh, transporting them. Um, and, and nightcrawlers are real popular fishing bait. So, so in the Kenai, where people have found nightcrawlers in the forest, that's always been near fishing sites. Um, and so earthworms eat um, not just the leaf litter, but they eat the seeds. They love to eat seeds. I didn't even know that, um, particularly like birch seeds. So they're going to change the seed bank, the number of seeds that are in the leaf litter. And what ends up happening is a lot of native plants that require this mycorrhizal fungal uh, leaf litter uh, ecosystem to survive, uh, once that leaf litter is gone, the mycorrhizae are gone, the native plants begin to suffer and they disappear and uh, invasive plants like grasses and other things can move in. So that's why they talk about earthworms as ecosystem engineers. They can have a small, one species can have a huge impact. Um, we know they're beneficial for agriculture and for gardens, and the composting worm that a lot of people may have in your own compost are fine. They, they, they cannot survive in our uh, forests over winter. They die off because of the cold. Um, but, but the other species, they seem to be doing um, okay. One of the five species we found in uh, Megan's study uh, may very well be a North American native it's kind of something we were wondering about, but it seems like there is this uh, group of earthworms that um, have survived in North America despite the glaciers, and, and, that, and we have one of those. Um, I actually have it in my backyard. Um, since this study came out last year, uh, we've had some news reports, and people have sent in more earthworms, and we've done some more sampling. We don't have five species anymore. We now have 10. There's 10 species of earthworms that live in the Fairbanks area. And that, that you know, <laughs> this has all happened within, um, you know, 12 months of research. Um, and, and, you know, you talk to people and they'll say, oh, yeah, I, I, I've had earthworms in my garden, um, you know, since the 80s. In fact, I'll do a survey. Does anybody know of any earthworms uh, that they know about from, let's say, before the 2000s in Fairbanks area? Yeah? Yeah? 
Yeah. yeah, okay. So, and that's actually one of the places that was sampled as well. Um, so uh, there are probably some old populations of earthworms. It's not like this has all just happened overnight. Um, but it is kind of surprising how we went from zero to 10, and, um, or at least you know, we didn't have scientific knowledge of the others. So let's talk about something a little, uh, a little nicer. Let's talk about butterflies. So um, my, ma my master's advisor wouldn't like me saying that because he was a beetle specialist. He's like, butterflies, don't get distracted. It's going to. Um, so, uh, but you all, a lot of you probably know Ken Phillip or knew Ken Phillip. He was a butterfly specialist, uh, Alaska's butterfly specialist, and he had been working on butterflies in Alaska since the 1960s. Uh, we finally published his field guide uh, two years after he died, and he died in 2014. Um, and he'd been working on this for his whole life, or not his whole life, but his whole Alaskan life. And um, it in the, we went to second edition um, in 2016, and it includes this new species that was described in 2016. It's uh, Aeneas tanana, and it's found in the Tanana Valley. And it, um, for at least a little while, it was a butterfly that was known only from Alaska. It didn't occur anywhere else except Alaska. But it has recently been discovered in uh, the Yukon as well. So now it's not slightly less special, but it's still a really cool butterfly. Uh, and if <clears throat> you're interested in seeing Ken's collection, if you haven't already seen it, because he'd like to invite people to his house to show it off, we have photographed every drawer and made a website that allows you to look at every drawer and uh, magnify the butterflies, and there's educational modules, etc. So if you just Google Ken Phillip collection, you'll find this um, website. You can see um, from the, each row is a different species of butterfly, and each dot represents that species was documented in that year. So here's 1900 up to 2020, and you can see where Ken arrived in the state. Um, <laughs> but there were a few, few records from before Ken's arrival. Um, some people um, wonder about all that collecting of butterflies, because Ken had over uh, 100,000 specimens in his collection. Um, isn't that bad for the butterflies? Isn't that damaging their um, populations? Well, like I mentioned before, insects reproduce at such enormously high numbers that it's very hard to damage their populations um, by swinging a butterfly net. Um, uh, road mortality of Lepidoptera, this was a study from 2001 in Illinois, 20 million butterflies and moths are killed per week. Um, during the summertime. Uh, so the, the 20 million, I mean, it's a ridiculously high number, and yet this was back before there was any sign of declines. Um, this was just sort of normal routine mortality, populations are doing fine, 20 million killed by cars every week. Um, so whether this is actually contributing to insect declines now um, or not is an open question. Uh, Ken would like, and there's Ken, a picture of Ken I took um, out on the Steese Highway when, we, when he invited me out on a collecting trip. He says, my own collecting during the entire time I've been collecting in Alaska, um, including all the samples from his 600 volunteers, uh, more than 600 volunteers who sent in samples, um, divided into his area of interest, all of Alaska, Yukon, um, Northwest Territories, and, and he went to Russia on three occasions amounts to approximately one specimen killed per 1,000 square miles per year. So his, his impact was negligible um, on the uh, populations that he was sampling. And his, those specimens are uh, priceless. Um, they are, we don't have a time machine. We can't go back to the 70s and collect these things. Um, the only way to study those specimens is to uh, have them preserved in a museum. Uh, so, my graduate student, Catherine Daly, who um, did her master's thesis using Ken's collection, and she's now graduated. Um, her thesis is still uh, unpublished, so I'm not going to give you too much information, but um, one of her chapters looked at flight activity. And um, butterflies fly at the same temperature. Once, the, once a certain thermal uh, temperature has been achieved in a region, butterflies start flying. and um, it, what's been happening is that temperature has been occurring earlier and earlier and earlier in the year. So butterflies have been flying earlier in the year. So here's 1965, uh, the flight activity, the day of year. This is the day of year. Um, 
up to the 90s, about a 3.9 days per decade advancement for the tiger swallowtail. Um, she looked at 15 species in Fairbanks, and um, a lot of them were flying earlier, um, had the same sort of pattern. She also looked at wing length changes, which is something you really need uh, uh, access to the specimens for, because she measured, and she and her students measured, the lengths of the wings um, of three species on the North Slope over the same time period and found, just like they found in Greenland, well, two of the three species were getting smaller in years following warmer summers. So they're, when their caterpillars were feeding in a warm summer, the adult butterflies that emerged from those caterpillars were smaller than they would have been otherwise. Um, so, um, moving on, spruce bark beetles. So these are, um, you've all heard about these, and the, the beetles that fly around here with the big long antennae, those are not spruce bark beetles. Those are spruce sawyers. They do feed on spruce, um, but they're not the bark beetles that kill the spruce. Um, the spruce sawyers, um, which some people call them pincher bugs, um, they're native, they're not, and they don't really like to, to pinch people unless you get them disturbed. So if one lands on you, you know, don't whack it or anything, just try to remain calm, and um, <laughs> particularly if you're driving like that, yeah. So uh, spruce bark beetles are much smaller, they're, they're um, like a quarter of an inch or less, and um, in the 90s, there was a massive outbreak on the Kenai, where the spruce bark beetles, um, massive outbreak in the 90s, the temperatures, notice, so this is temperatures, the temperatures during that time period were above this black line. And that allowed this outbreak to really get rolling. And basically, the bark beetles swept through and killed all the mature spruce until they ran out of food until all the mature spruce were killed on the Kenai. Um, and uh, so the, all the available host material was exhausted. Um, now this is a uh, graph coming from Ed Berg's work, a 2015 article he wrote. Um, and, and what he was doing with this is projecting the future. So here's the black line. And the future is going to basically have temperatures on the Kenai that are always above that black line meaning it'll always be warm enough for the beetles to reach these enormous populations and, and have that same kind of outbreak, as long as there's enough spruce for them to feed on. Um, we currently have a, a big outbreak in south central um, Alaska. Matt Sue is having a massive bark beetle outbreak. 900,000 acres are um, being fed upon by these um, beetles. I don't like using the word infested. Just it's a little bit negative term. I don't like using the word attack. They don't attack trees. I mean, do moose attack willow? I, I don't think so. I think the beetles just feed on the trees just like the moose feed on the willow. Um, so let's you know, use the right terms. All right, so um, these beetles, uh, yeah. So basically, spruce um, are uh, seeing quite a, um, a problem. And, and it, they're getting hit from both sides because climate change isn't just making the beetles have an easier time of breeding. Um, climate change is making spruce uh, uh, suffering from more droughts. So this is work uh, from Beck et al. 2011 showing um, their basic conclusion. So the brown dots show regions in Alaska where spruce are uh, showing reduced productivity. And they say, um, our data suggests the climate of the last two decades has shifted beyond the physiological optimum for spruce growth throughout the Alaska boreal ecosystem. So here's uh, from a different work. This is from a USGS paper. This is the spruces, the red dots show where spruce grow based on precipitation and temperature. So as the temperatures warm up, you need to have more precipitation in order for those spruce to survive. But at some point, there's no amount of precipitation that's gonna work and it's too hot for the spruce. So the spruce are um, basically, yeah, there's all these problems. Now we don't have any bark beetle outbreak, any signs of bark beetle outbreaks up north of the Alaska Range. So far, all the bark beetle outbreaks have been south of the Alaska Range, where there are a lot more uh, of these big spruce. Sitka spruce are one of the favorites, um, but white spruce as well. The bark beetles don't really get into the black spruce. 
Um, okay. Uh, yellow jackets. I told you we'd talk about these. We had um, two deaths from yellow jackets back in 2006 when we had that large um, eruption of yellow jacket nests um, throughout the Fairbanks area. And those were the first reported deaths from yellow jacket stings in Alaska. Um, but like nationally, yellow jackets kill between 10 and 20 people a year um, from stings. Um, and uh, working with Jeffrey DeMaine in Anchorage, uh, who went through the medical databases, he um, looked at, we looked at these different regions of Alaska and compared the sting incidents between 1999-2001 versus 2004-2006 16 versus 119, 62 versus 133, um, 276 versus 405. Uh, Juno, not quite as big as increase, and Kodiak, the, uh, which had the least temperature increase, had uh, very little uh, increase in stings. So basically, the places that have seen the greatest warmth have also seen the greatest increase in stings. Uh, so that's a bit of a concern. Uh, this I would really like to see. We want to. I want to get back into those medical databases and, and get longer-term data set on that because that's interesting stuff. Um, so to um, wrap things up here, I want to whip through. I had a, another graduate student who's working on um, these lovely beetles that live on snowfields, and this is their distribution. They occur in the mountains and they get up into Alaska, and they like to feed. They use snowfields as a uh, basically a refrigerator that's always stocked with food because. Insects are being blown up from the lower elevations. They get cold, they stick to the snow fields, and then they're frozen and dead there, and the beetles come out and feed on them. It's wonderful, some birds like to do this as well. A uh, wonderful way to make a living if you're a beetle. Um, and there's one I photographed um, when doing some alpine work myself. Uh, so my graduate student um, described a number of new species uh, and worked out the phylogeny of this group. Um, but one of the concerns is uh, these snowpacks are uh, getting smaller. So here's 1949 versus 2004, the same area. Um, here we have a statement saying that climate change has already reduced snow cover in the Rockies by 20% since 1980s. Um, uh, a nice satellite image of January 2017 versus 18 of the Sierras. The snowpack um, is going to go up, mount up slope by about 950 feet. Um, so this entire sort of alpine ecosystem is changing pretty dramatically. Uh, and of course, it, the area gets smaller as you go up. Um, uh, this was a study back from 76, right out of our own Institute of Arctic Biology, looking at the uh, nutrient transport, a quantitative study of Alaskan snow patches, um, which uh, was one of the first to really um, quantify that. So here are the beetles. And here's the quote, um, the unique snow field and high elevation stream habitat association of most Phleopter species may render these beetles at risk of extirpation, meaning um, sort of ex local extinction, or even global extinction, by a warming climate. Two species described here have not been collected since 1979 and 1984, despite people having gone to those same regions and collected other species of the same genus. So they were in the, in the area looking for them and couldn't find them, and um, we don't know what their status is. Um, uh, this is a colleague of mine from the California Academy of Sciences who described this new species of beetle from, um, it's found from only one place in the Sierra Nevadas at the toe of a melting, rapidly melting glacier. When this glacier disappears, the cold stream that keeps this species um, uh, comfortable will also disappear and the species will likely disappear as well. So a couple um, final slides. I want to give you time to ask some questions here. This is, um, it's kind of hard to find a good slide showing the land bridge and the ice sheets at the same time. But here, this, this nicely shows Beringia back about, um, what was this, 18,000 years ago. Uh, so species could just kind of move in from uh, what, was, what is Asia into Alaska. And they uh, couldn't get really far into Canada because of the ice sheets. So what this has ended up, uh, one of the results of this is a number of species in Alaska that don't occur in Canada um, and may very well be uh, uh, found only in Alaska. So this is the list of all the different species. We have over 370 
three arthropod species that are only found in Alaska. And when people talk to me about conservation of bumblebees, well, if the bumblebee is found, if a certain species of bumblebee is found across all of North America and it's doing well in a lot of places, that's, to me, that's um, less of a concern as an Alaskan than a species that's found only in Alaska. Because we, we want to make sure that those species don't disappear because if they disappear um, under our watch, um, it's kind of Alaskans are to blame, I guess, um, or whatever is going on in Alaska is to blame. So this is one of them. This is a beautiful little uh, beetle. It's blind and wingless. Um, and it is, it's actually a giant for its group, and it's uh, just over one millimeter in length. Um, <laughs> Um, and it lives on Chena Ridge. Um, and in order to find it, you have to go under the leaf litter into the mineral soil, and that's where it lives. You have to collect the mineral soil and wash it, and there's all these fancy things you have to do. But this species and this genus is known from nowhere else, just interior Alaska. It's one of our many endemics. Um, so I'm going to just uh, summarize what I've gone through here. Um, We've got many examples of probable climate change impacts on invertebrates globally. We have rain shifts that we're documenting in um, bumblebees and butterflies and many other species. Uh, we have biomass declines. We don't really know the causes. We know habitat loss and alteration are likely. Pesticide use is another possibility. Climate change is obviously another possibility. Um, Alaska, even though we're learning more about the fauna, we don't have a very good pre-warming baseline, and we certainly don't have any of these kind of 30-year biomass uh, data sets um, for, uh, well, the Forest Service has been doing a pretty good job with some of the uh, forest-related insects that uh, they care about, um, including the bark beetles. Um, so those are, those are probably our best long-term abundance data sets. Um, Non-native species like ticks and earthworms are moving in. There are some potentially threatened species like these alpine um, species. And anything that feeds on spruce in Alaska may have trouble once the spruce begins to disappear. Insect outbreaks, uh, bark beetles and wasps. Um, we're seeing uh, wing length and phenology changes in butterflies, et cetera. So I'll leave you with this quote. With each generation, the amount of environmental degradation increases but each generation takes that amount as the norm. And that's the, kind of the sad thing. None of us know what it's like to have a flock of passenger pigeons fly over our head, and um, we think it's normal not to have them. So um, I will take any questions you may have, and thanks for being such a great audience. Um, <laughs> Any comment on the Aspen leaf miner or whatever its yeah. proper name is, yeah. and if it's more or less? So it was um, in very high outbreak status for quite, quite a number of years, and then started to drop down a few years back, um, but now it's, it's picking back up again. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't cause very much damage to the Aspen. Um, they tend to uh, do, do okay with a fairly heavy load of Aspen leaf miners. Um, but once you start adding in drought stress and other, other factors, it, be, it can like multiply into something that could end up being problematic for them. We have um, a number of people here in uh, bio wildlife, Pat Doak and um, Diane Wagner, primarily focusing on that study system. So they, they know gobs more about it than I could ever elaborate on. But yeah, yeah. Another question here? Thank you. Um, I hate to take you back to worms. Uh -huh. but there is a Ice worms. I used to think they were a joke. Yeah. Um, but no, I've seen them. Yeah. And had they recoil, had them recoil from the heat of my finger yeah. up against that ice in the glacier. And with the glacier shrinking, that's certainly an issue for these. Yeah, yeah. Ice worms are um, in the same group of worms. So one thing I didn't mention with the earthworms is there is a bigger group, a family called the uh, Echi. Enchytraeidae, which are um, commonly known as potworms, and the ice worms are also in that group. And they are very cold adapted, and they occur all throughout Alaska. So up in the Arctic, the, um, I, was, I found them out in uh, St. Matthew Island and the Aleutians, and 
um, cold, wet habitats, they do great. Um, and they, are, they sometimes get big enough to be confused with earthworms. So if you are looking around for, for earthworms, it, it, uh, potworms tend to be paler. They're not as pink. They tend to be much smaller and, and thinner. Um, the, the ice worms, though, are black. Um, I've never seen them. I, I've only heard the stories and read about them, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I guess they feed on the algae on the tops of the glaciers and they're, they're limited distribution. But the, the glacier, I, I, I mean, I'm not a glaciologist. I shouldn't talk about it. But it seems like the, the, region, the area where they occur um, has a lot of glaciers. Um, so, so at least temporarily, they're probably going to do OK. Um, so yeah, interesting creatures, ice worms. In 2002, when the Compton tortoiseshell butterflies just exploded uh, here in interior Alaska, any thoughts as to where they came from if they hadn't been reported here before? Yes, yeah, so there are a couple species of butterflies. Um, that one, what are there's a, it's a terrible with butterflies, um, that uh, that have what are called eruptions, where they just, um, some summers, they just make a really big push northward. Um, so from, from their normal distribution in lower latitudes, uh, suddenly they're flying around um, many hundreds of miles to the north of where they have never been before. And um, they usually just die off. Um, but in this case, uh, it didn't die off. <laughs> so that was, that's, that's probably, you know, uh, Ken Phillip had never recorded them in Fairbanks before 2002, but I think there were records of them uh, from, um, the co from coastal Alaska. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Question here in front of the camera. Yeah, I don't want to raise my hand too high. <laughs> um, Hello. I feel like you missed something in your entire presentation that you only brought up with butterflies, and that is the evolutionary change in insects based off of uh, climate change. So you're asking about that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so the wing length changes is probably not evolutionary. Uh, it's it's merely a uh, general symptom that if you are deprived of enough calories, you end up smaller. Um, and that's, we see that with insects in general. But you're, you're wondering if insects will adapt to uh, a warmer world. Or how, what, what will happen to them. Right. So um, there's going to be winners and losers. There's some that are probably going to adapt. Like I said, some are going to um, do well. Um, but evolution happens, you know, evolution can happen fairly quickly with insects because there are a lot of insects that are what we call univoltine, meaning their entire population dies off uh, each year and is replaced by their offspring. So all the butterflies flying this year are going to be dead um, before the end of the summer and it's their offspring that are going to replace them next year. So if something happens to maybe to their food plant or something, boom. You know. But it also allows them to, since they have such enormous populations, uh, to evolve fairly quickly. So we could see um, evolution that allows species to take advantage of, of climate change. But I think that's going to, it's going to be, it's going to be probably pretty rare and it's going to be um, overshadowed by um, all of the rather rapid population changes of things that can't uh, adapt um, quickly enough. But um, if s some species do end up adapting, what would be their adaptation? Or what could oh, physiological, like being able to take advantage of the warmer temperatures or, or not, you know, be able to tolerate the warmer temp temperatures. Um, there's a lot of studies where they put insects in um, temperature chambers and, and you just get to lethal temperatures at a certain point. Um, and if they can, if they can uh, push their lethal temperatures higher up so they can survive, that's, that would definitely help them. Well, we got to wait for the mic. Sorry, I could repeat your question. I, I, I guess. Okay, I'll repeat your question. How much do we know about the importance of mosquitoes in the Alaska food chain? Uh, <laughs> how much do we know about the importance? Benefits. Right, uh, the importance of mosquitoes in the Alaska food chain. Uh, another way of saying, what good are mosquitoes, or why do mosquitoes exist? 
I, I hear that question a lot. Um, and I often, um, well, I usually give the rather flippant answer that mosquitoes exist to make more mosquitoes, um, <clears throat> which is their primary purpose in life. But um, what do they do in the environment? Um, there are some that pollinate. Uh, the males, for example, don't drink blood. The males um, are uh, flower visitors, and there's even some that specialize on certain orchids. So um, we have mosquitoes in the collection that have the pollinia of the orchids stuck to them um, because they were pollinating orchids when they were collected. Um, and <clears throat> um, but mosquitoes also are a big food source, obviously, um, both in the larval stage for various aquatic organisms, um, including fish, and um, as adults, they're food for a lot of um, flying uh, insectivores, both birds and dragonflies, et cetera. Um, so they, if they were to go extinct globally, um, it would probably be a net benefit to humanity, at least, because of the malaria and other uh, uh, diseases that are transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, but so they don't seem to be some kind of a keystone species that if they disappeared, you'd see the sort of unraveling of, of, the, of the ecosystem. Um, they, um, but there may be some organisms that go a little hungry without them. So, yeah. And obviously some plants that might not get pollinated. This is in the mosquito thing, but um, you know those signs that the mosquito pest control are starting to pop up in yeah. those yards now. Is that killing all the insects in the yard, and is that affecting the birds then too? Is yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Um, I'm I'm a little worried, and I would love I'd love there to be a really good study, um, but we don't have insecticides that can only kill mosquitoes. They kill everything. Um, so if you've got bees in your yard or your neighbor has bees and, and you've got the Mosquito Authority spraying in your yard, um, some of that could affect uh, neighboring yards, um, but it's unknown to what degree. Um, and I've had people contact me and um, both with concerns and with, with annual reports, um, and I, you know, I just don't know what to make of it. Um, I, I think in general, you know, it, it's common sense that if, if one or two people in a neighborhood are spraying, um, it's, not, it's probably not too big a problem. But if half the people in a neighborhood start spraying, half the ho houses start getting uh, sprayed, then that place is going to become a death zone. You know, bees are going to enter that area and they're not going to escape or they're going to run out of food or whatever. So it's, um, it's a matter of degree, I think. So it's, yeah. One more question. A few years back, we had a problem back we had it around Fairbanks, a uh, tiny fly that was erupting, and I think you were concerned that it was actually going to get into the collections. Um, what's happened with that little thing? Yeah, so that is, um, that is this lovely little thing called a grass fly that um, is uh, a Beringian um, species, apparently. Um, this thing... Uh, was get, still gets into our buildings here on camp, this building in particular. If you want to see them, go into the stairwell and look down on the sides because they, they get into buildings, they go up against windows, and they, they dehydrate and die and fall down. So there's piles of them down there. So there are these things. <clears throat> and in Benel, where they didn't have uh, screens on the windows, gallons of these things were being collected. In uh, the museum, we were getting them against our south-facing windows up at the top. So our, our workers had to go up and use these huge vacuum cleaners to vacuum, vacuum them up because they were, they were accumulating up there. They're, like, they're like, kind of like um, fruit flies on steroids. They're a little bigger than fruit flies. Um, and in the museum, I told them, um, you've, you've got a hole, you know, because they're not coming in the front door. Um, there must be a hole somewhere in the wall that allows these things to get in because they look for overwintering cracks and crevices. So they're really good at finding little ways to get in. And so once I told them that, they looked for the hole, they found the hole, they plugged it, problem solved. So the flies were actually kind of beneficial helping us fix our building. Um, <laughs> they haven't done that with Murray yet. Um, but, uh, but they're Beringian in that, that that mass kind of late summer overwintering aggregation has only been reported from Alaska and, um, and Russia. Um, but the rest, like I, when I was, first saw this, I sent out an email to all the entomologists in North America and said, 
are you familiar with this fly? No one had heard about it in North America. Yeah, it's very, it's one of these things from, from Beringia. Yeah. So. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>